Good. Um, would, would you agree that the subject of where life came from and evolution, all that, is it, would, would you agree that's a controversial subject? Does this kind of get people riled up a little bit? Um, I'll tell you a little uh, story, but before I do, I, I, I'm going to preface this by saying I'm going to approach this from an angle that very few of you probably ever heard before. Um, and as the story unfolds, I think you'll see that. But, I, but by the time we're done, I think we'll, we will have reduced uh, some very big questions to, to some very uh, simple principles. And I, I, think, I think you'll feel empowered. Um, I, I think that this war between science and faith is totally uh, a figment of imaginations, actually. But, um, but it, the war doesn't stop until you kind of diffuse the fear and be willing to dive in and see, well, what does science really say? What does the Bible really say? What is faith really all about? How do, what is the relationship between science and faith? And this story starts in China, in southern China, where my brother lived for four years, um, on, on this bus. Um, and uh, I know that doesn't look like much of a bus, but that's the Chinese version of a bus. Um, and uh, what was going on, uh, I guess you might say, my younger brother was growing up. My younger brother had a, he's a very, very bright, smart, sharp guy, uh, maybe even more than he knows sometimes. Um, he had been to seminary. He had extensive Bible education. But the growing up part was he was he had got to a point where he was asking questions that he had been afraid to ask, and he was not liking some of the answers that he came up with. And he was really in a process of throwing his Christian faith out the window. Okay. And uh, this had me very rattled, okay? Um, uh, he and I uh, act, uh, are both pastor's kids, actually. Um, and he, uh, I, I kind of had my meandering path. He had never strayed far from it. And then all of a sudden, at what, age 30 or something, he goes, Zhoo! And, um, and, and so we're riding on this bus and we're having this argument about a whole bunch of stuff and, this, and the subject of, of uh, kind of the creation and evolution stuff kind of uh, came up. And, and I said, I said, Brian, you don't, you don't honestly believe, like, you know, look at the hand at the end of your arm. You don't, like, honestly believe that that's the result of some kind of accident, do you? Okay, and he says, well, now hang on just a second. And he was ready for this question, okay? And he says, no, I want you, he, and he's, he's coming right back at me. He says, he says, he says, let's say that there's like 500 million falcons flying around and eating and pooping and everything that falcons do, okay? And you got 500 million of them, and you got 500 million years that they're doing all this. And every once in a while, one of them accidentally develops, you know, some new gene or some new muscle, and it can see better. And then it can catch its prey better than all the other falcons. And then it ends up, you know, overcoming all the other ones through natural selection. And then the falcons get a little better, and they get a little better, and they get a little better. And hey, you know, if you got a few billion years, how do you know that can't happen? Okay, and when he asked me that, I knew I didn't really have an answer, and doggone it, he might be right. Now I'm even more rattled, okay? And, and, and I should add that, that this particular topic was one that I, I mean, I've done a lot of different things in my life, um, I, I used to be in acoustics. I designed the speakers in the 95 Jeep Cherokee and the 94 Ford Probe and the 94 Acura Vigor. Okay, so I, I've done acoustics. Um, I wrote an Ethernet book. Ethernet is that blue cable that plugs into your computer and gets you on the internet. I learned, I, you know, master, I did that, okay? Um, I'm a high-priced business consultant. I've done that. I've done a lot of different things. And one of the things that you learn is you go into different fields and you, 
you know, like you're going to learn something new and you go into it, you always find that the way you thought things were when you first went into them and then the way things really are once you really learn it are often very, very different. Like what you think is important is very, very different. And what I knew about this whole creation evolution thing was I didn't know enough to know. Okay? And that like a really simple answer like the one that I'm asking him, like, well, gee, you look at your hand, you don't think that could like be the result of an accident or something. That's a very shallow way of asking a very complex question, and most people just sort of glaze over or just pick a side and then cling to it. And it's like, well, gee, you know, I really don't know the answer to this, but I was so bothered that I decided I better go start looking. Well, so I start looking, and I go home, and I start buying books, and I start surfing the internet, and I very, very quickly, and I think a lot of you guys will relate to this, uh, I very quickly became just literally nauseated at the people screaming at each other over these questions. Okay, like, 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 gee, do you think you could have any more angst than you've got, you know? The creationists are, fire, you know, screaming at the evolutionists, and the evolutionists are screaming at the creationists, and it's just, it's like nobody's really listening to each other. And that really bothered me. And it, it was also a sign that maybe, um, you know, the ones that are yelling the loudest, maybe those are the ones that you should not be listening to if you want to actually learn something. But then there's a, there was another level that this bothered me, which was most of what these people are arguing about is not stuff that you could ever come to a solid conclusion about anyway. Okay? So let's take, for example, fossils. Somebody lays a whole bunch of fossils on the table, and they say, see, these fossils tell this story. And then some other guy walks in the room and goes, no, you idiot. Here, watch this. And he rearranges them all. He says, no, see, they tell this story. And you just argue about this back and forth and back and forth. And what bothered me was most of this argument never seemed to get down to any kind of solid core principle of something that you could sink your teeth into. And I had, I had enough, I have an engineering degree, I've had enough math, I've had enough physics. Like, there ought to be a better way to get to the bottom of these questions than, than all this political stuff that you read in the newspaper. And so I started, I, I had a sense of what I was looking for. And that sense mostly just came from having done other completely different things, and there was a sort of familiarity to, okay, I start at the beginning and everything's really confusing, but by the time it, I get to the end, there's a certain way that this ought to feel and, and I will also add that I was open to whatever, wherever this led me. Okay? It's like, okay, whatever the truth is about this, I want to know. I just want to know. And so, here's what we're going to talk about today. Is life random? This is a major fundamental question. Is evolution random? to whatever extent that evolution may happen. And by the way, I don't look at creation versus evolution as an either-or question. That's one of the things that, I, that, I, that I'm going to, uh, that's going to come out of our discussion tonight. And to whatever extent evolution happens, how does it happen? Okay, that's a really important question, okay? Is it creation versus evolution, or is there actually... Like, are there things on both sides of this argument that are, like, both right? Is there a synthesis? And, uh, and, and new directions for the origins debate. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, um, to lay, lay some background here and, I, um, and, and show you a couple things. There are some things that happen that are very orderly that nobody has to design. For example... I got a picture of a tornado here, and if you've got hot air and cold air and moisture and time in just the proper mixture, you get tornadoes, okay? Does everybody agree, like, nobody has to design a tornado? God does not have to decree there is going to be 
I mean, you could have a theological argument about whether God does that or not, but, but you know, clouds go across the sky, nobody has to design that. Uh, tornadoes happen, nobody has to design a tornado. Does anybody have to design a snowflake? No. No. You take water, cold air, gravity, wind, it blows up and down. Well, I guess that's hail, right? And the, and the ice crystal has fallen, and, and, and it grows, and you get a snowflake. And every single one is different, but they have you know, these similar patterns. Nobody has to design an individual snowflake. It occurs naturally. Okay? And just so you understand why I'm bringing up this example, a lot of people say, well, life occurs naturally. Just like snowflakes do. Well, we're going to come around to that question, and we're going to look at that. Now, what, 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 I just, what I just showed is two naturally occurring patterns, a snowflake, a, a hurricane, a tornado. Now, let's talk about a different kind of thing. Okay, this is music is designed, meaning... And when I talk about a design, let me, let me explain what I mean when I use the word design. When I use the word design, I mean there is a plan that comes before the thing is built. There is a plan first, and then the plan is implemented. Okay? Now, on the left, I've got a sheet of music. Okay? That's a symbolic representation of the music, which is not the same as, as what you hear when a band is playing, but it's the same music. You understand what I'm saying? Or I could take a book, okay, and I could read out of the book. And the words that I say are the same as the words on the page, but they're actually a completely different form. One is ink on a piece of paper, the other one is a sound, but in either case you have to interpret it in order for it to have meaning, okay? Microsoft Windows. On that CD is actually just a bunch of ones and zeros, but when you decode the ones and zeros, you get a screen, and it looks like what you see on the right. So you have a symbolic representation of the program. That's on the left. Then you have the implementation of the, of, of the program. That's on the right. So software is something that's designed. Music is something that is designed. Okay? Does software, is, does software like happen naturally? As far as you know, as far as you've ever seen, no. Does music, you know, like with chords and quarter notes and eighth notes and time signatures, does music happen naturally? Not as far as we know, okay? And so I, I, I want to illustrate a distinction here between a pattern and information. A naturally occurring pattern, like a tornado or a snowflake, comes from chaos. There's a whole field of science called chaos theory that talks about why every snowflake is a little different. It's simply matter and energy. It requires no thought on the part of anybody. On the right, a piece of music, a map of Washington, D.C., Chinese symbols, a piece of software, all those are information based, okay? They're based on a code. A sheet of music, is that a code? A quarter note, an eighth note, a rest, that's a code, right? And all musicians agree on what quarter note is, so they can all play, right? Or maps, or Chinese, you know, everybody that reads Chinese agrees what that symbol means, and so because there's agreement on what symbols mean, um, then you can read it. Well, when you get into the realm of information, you're not dealing with matter, you're not dealing with only matter and energy. Information is a separate entity. Information is something different than just matter and energy, and information always requires thought. Okay? So now, I'm going to talk about DNA. Every cell in your body has a strand of DNA with about 3 billion letters in it. Okay? Uh, the shortest DNA that's ever found in nature is like 500,000 letters. 
years is three billion. It would fill volumes of encyclopedias. Um, it's, uh, it's about the same amount of information as you can put on an entire uh, CD. Like if you burn a CD, if you burn it till it's full, that's about how much information is stored in every cell of your body, and it's a plan for building your body. Okay? And, and, and the way, the way to, just a real rudimentary explanation of DNA is it's a helix. It's got these two strands that twist around, and in the middle are like rungs of a ladder. And when DNA makes a copy of itself, that helix splits, that ladder splits, and chemicals come, and they fill in, they, they come into place, and they match where the old one was, and then an, an, another rung comes up, and when it's done, there's two strands of DNA instead of one, and they're identical, and they have the same letters. And by letters, those little rungs of the ladder um, are bases called adenine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine. It's a four-letter alphabet. So like computers have ones and zeros, that's a two-letter alphabet. DNA is a four-letter alphabet with four, four letters, okay? It encodes all the information necessary for life, 500,000 to 3 billion letters, okay? And there's something very interesting about DNA, is that those letters form characters, and the characters form letters, and the letters form words, and the words form sentences, and the sentences form paragraphs, and the paragraphs form chapters. You ever heard of chromosomes? You can think of chromosomes as, as chapters in the book of DNA, and you have 46 of them. So it's like 46 chapters, and there's a whole hierarchy of language. Just like English has all those things on the right, all the things on the left, nucleotide, codon, gene, operon, regulon, chromosome, those are hierarchies of DNA information. DNA is not just a chemical, but the pattern in the chemical is a language. Okay, It has all the same characteristics as a computer language, or kind of like music, or, or you know, any number of human languages. Uh, you can, if you went and you studied books on linguistics, most books, uh, many books on linguistics at least mention that DNA has a, um, a semantical structure that's uh, rather similar to human language, okay? So here's the question. Is DNA a pattern like snowflakes and hurricanes, or is it a language? Well, DNA is a code. And that's a really important, the idea of a code, that there is a symbolic relationship, that when those letters are strung together, they form instructions. And the instructions tell a cell how to, how to build a new, a leg, a claw, an arm, a wing, an eye, just like, just like your watch might have instructions to beep it at you at 7.30 in the morning. It has instructions in the exact same sense as a computer language, okay? A DNA molecule symbolically represents something other than yourself. Somebody could scrape a little cell of skin and put it under a microscope, and if you know if they were smart enough and they had enough data, they could go, "Oh, that's you." Now that strand of DNA is not you, but it is a representation of you, right? So is DNA more like a stalactite, a tornado, a snowflake, or is it more like music maps, computer programs, and Chinese? It's like the latter. It is not like the former. So where do codes come from? Patterns like snowflakes and hurricanes, they occur naturally. We know that. Nobody has to design a snowflake. But, and this is kind of gets to the whole point of, 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 of my presentation, 
random processes, accidents, weather, they don't create codes. A code is symbolic, right? If we agree that a quarter note is, you know, is supposed to last this long, then we all agree on that. That is something that we have, we have made a decision to agree on, right? Okay? And then somebody could go write a computer program that reads the notes, and the computer could go through a very mechanical process of reading the notes, but somebody would have had to program it first to do what it does. Okay? No one has ever discovered a code that was not ultimately designed by somebody. Ever. And you can take that to the bank. Nobody has ever discovered a code that wasn't designed. Nobody has ever discovered a symbolic relationship that wasn't designed. Because in nature, i got a rock. Go pick up a rock. Does this rock contain any symbols? No. It's a rock. That's all that it is. Nothing in the purely physical world creates plans, instructions, or codes, or symbols. Okay? So, here, here's a way to think of it. Let's say that we go far from Earth. We go to some other solar system or we go to some planet very far from Earth, okay? You will not find any codes anywhere. Unless some form of life exists there that we don't know about, there's no codes, there's no symbols. If there's rocks, there's rocks. If there's molecules, there's molecules. If there's asteroids, there are asteroids. But there's no symbolic representation of anything. Because to have a symbolic representation... You have to have a mental process. Somebody has to make a decision. They have to make a choice. Can you derive quarter notes from the laws of physics? Could, could you open a physics book and say, here, show me where quarter notes come from? No. Quarter notes are something that people agreed on. It's a, it's a convention. You can't, you, can't go to the, you can't derive the English language, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You can't get that from the laws of physics. Laws of physics says, hey, you know, you throw a rock up in the air and gravity pulls it back down. It doesn't explain where letters and symbols and ideas come from. That there's this infinite chasm between the physical world and the world of ideas, and DNA contains ideas. It clearly does. Go look it up in the dictionary. It's a code. This guy here in the picture, his name is Norbert Wiener. He was... Uh, a, a, a mathematician at MIT. Um, his heyday was in the 50s and 60s. He helped um, create many of the concepts, like uh, if you have a cruise control in your car, um, he had a lot to do with figuring out all the math that would, you know, that would cause a cruise control to be accurate or to get a guided missile where it needs to go. He's one of the pioneers in, in the information age that we live in now and take for granted. And he said something very interesting. He said, information is information. It is not matter or energy. No materialism that does not admit this can survive the present day. What he's saying is, there's not, like, usually when you talk about the universe or what you talk about, there's matter and there's energy, Right? you know, rocks and molecules and stuff, and there's energy like sunlight. But what Norbert Wiener is saying, there's a third entity, is information is an entity, and it's separate from either of those two. You can't get information from matter and energy. It's a separate thing. He said this about 50 years ago. So, what, what this brings me to is a very, very simple argument, and this is what it is. Number one, DNA is a code. Go look it up in a dictionary. It's a code. Two, all codes that we know the origin of are designed. Therefore, DNA is designed. Therefore, God exists. Okay? Now, I have 
debated this on the largest atheist website in the world for two years, and they are as mad as hornets. <laughs> and you go look it up. You go to cosmicfingerprints.com slash infidels. Infidels is the biggest atheist website in the world. It's 15,000 pages of rage and vitriol. Um, and and, and you, you, could, you could go read the whole entire thing. It's like probably got a thousand posts on this discussion board by now. But it's all there. If you want to go read it, it's all there. But let me back up. There, I, I, I kind of skipped a step. There's actually, okay, DNA is a code. All codes that we know the origin of are designed. Therefore, what? Well, that, there's actually five different answers. Where did DNA come from? Well, one answer is, well, DNA was designed by humans. Okay, now wait a minute. Is there like a problem with that? Like, okay, what? Did somebody go back in time or something? Uh, I, I, does anybody like think that that's an acceptable answer to the riddle? I doubt it. DNA was designed by aliens. Okay, now you know what? That is actually a perfectly legitimate answer. It's perfectly logical. It's perfectly possible as far as I'm concerned. Does it solve any problems? Because the, then, then the, the, the next question is what? Where did the aliens come from? It doesn't answer anything. Okay. So, you know, so what? You know, the aliens had to come from somewhere. Okay, number three. This is the most common one you hear. It was a product of chance. Okay, now, that is a legitimate answer. Except, except, there's a huge problem with this, this answer. If Isaac Newton had said, okay, the apple falls out of the tree, and he goes, why did the apple fall out of the tree? Okay, what was the answer he came up with? Gravity, right? A force pulled it down. What if he'd said, well, it just fell by chance? What kind of answer is that? It's a non-answer. Okay, it's not systematic. It's not repeatable. It doesn't refer to anything that you could investigate further. It doesn't lend itself to any kind of experiment. Science... Is the, science is a belief that the world operates according to laws that can be discovered. Okay, why do the asteroids stay where they're supposed to stay instead of flying off somewhere? There's a reason. Somebody, really smart people can go figure out why. Okay, why does water flow downhill? There's a reason. A systematic explanation. Okay? Now, before I go further with this, something I want you to think about is, I'll, I'll just give you, I give, I'll give this to you and you can go think about it. The only reason that we have science in the first place is because back in the Middle Ages, people believed that God created an orderly world and they wanted to figure out what made it tick. That, that the, the beginnings of science were born out of a belief that God made a predictable systematic world, not a product of chance world. Okay? A uh, fourth explanation for where, where does information come from? Where does the genetic code come from? You know, how did it come to be that DNA has four letters, not five, not six, not two, not three? It could have. It very well could have. But it has four. And it follows a very specific set of rules. The rules are not derivable by the laws of physics unless you say, okay, there's an undiscovered law of physics that, that creates information. Well, if you... If you go to that answer, you can't go any further until you discover a naturally occurring code. And when somebody discovers a code that nobody designed, then they can investigate where this, what's this law of physics. But since nobody's ever seen a code that wasn't designed, number four gets you nowhere. 
And the only thing left is number five. It was designed. Okay, now why, did, why is five a helpful answer? Because if you assume it's designed, then, then you can also assume that if there's something you don't understand, there must be a good reason for it anyway. Okay, like your, your blood cells, they're, they're curved this way on top and they're curved inward on the bottom, right? Some of you guys know that. Now, who knows, who knows why blood cells have that curvature? Somebody can tell me why? There's a pretty simple answer. It's so, it's, it's so they don't get stuck. When they're like going through an artery, they'll they'll bend and they'll and they'll go through a really tiny capillary. Now there might be other reasons, but whenever you encounter something in science and you want to ask a why question, it only helps you to ask the why question if you can somehow assume, which is always a leap of faith, by the way, that there's an answer, that there's a reason. Okay? I would contend that number five is by far the best of these choices because it gives you reasons to ask more questions. So this is the atheist riddle. Show me a message that does not come from a mind. That's the riddle. Show me a message that doesn't come from a mind. So simple, any child can understand. So complex, no atheist can solve. Now... This is part two of my presentation. I have just established, through a logical argument, that the best available explanation for the origin of life is that it was designed. Okay? Now let's, I want to talk about this whole creation-evolution question. And I'm going to move really fast, and we'll be done hopefully about 20 minutes, and then we can have Q&A, we can talk as long as you guys want to talk. But a Christian and an atheist go to the zoo. Now, what could be more entertaining than that? <laughs> I mean, that is a zoo. You don't even need animals. <laughs> now, everybody, like, gets all uppity about, like, you know, is your, you know, is your daddy, who's your daddy? Is your daddy an ape? your mama, baboon, and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> People get, like, really uppity about that question. So let's just, let's, let's ask the question in a less uppity way. Did the antelope evolve into the giraffe? Or could an antelope have evolved into giraffe? Now, is that an okay question to ask? Would, okay, would anybody in this room, like, be really, really bothered and distraught if you figured out that antelopes turned into giraffes years and years ago and they grew a longer neck, would that, like, you know, break your heart or crush your faith? Would that, would that be okay? I figured it's okay. Okay, if you want to talk about men and baboons and stuff, then let's, let's set that aside. But, but, but see, I think this is a really good question. Okay? Could, you know, and I don't care if maybe the antelope was a camel. I don't care, but... <laughs> But, but the question is, like, if the neck needed to get longer, was there a way for that to happen? Is that a good question? I think it's a good question. Now, again, if you, if you line up a bunch of fossils, you, don't, you, you, you come up with a story. Somebody says, yes, it did. No, it didn't. Yes, it did. No, it didn't. But you don't have an explanation. It's like, I'm an engineer. I want to know how did the neck get longer? Like, how did it get all the extra vertebrae? You know, like giraffes have these valves in their neck where, you know, their head goes down and they drink water and it keeps the blood from all rushing into their brain. You know, there's a lot of complicated stuff going on in a giraffe neck. Where did it all come from, right? I don't know. You know, just saying, well, it just happened. Well, I had to see the trees were taller and... The, the, the giraffes were starving, and then there was a mutation, and the mutation caused the neck to be longer, and then the longer neck ones survived, and the other ones died. See, that's a story, but it's not an explanation, because it doesn't explain how the neck got all its parts. Okay? And so you have to reduce the question to first principles. So, 
Now, in, in, in the world of Darwinism, the normal explanation is random mutation of DNA, meaning, you know, these animals have these strands of DNA, and little by little, you know, the letters get switched around, and little mistakes and copying errors happen. And most of the time, the copying errors are bad, but some of the time they're good, and then the good ones outlast the bad ones, and evolution moves forward. And all you need, random mutation, natural selection, time, it's all you need. And that's, like, that's the party line. That's what they say, and, 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 and that's what's defended. But my question as an engineer is, okay, is this really true? Okay, is this really true? Now, um, I mentioned that um, I had written an Ethernet book. Um, and, you know, the, about, all, you know, how ones and zeros get from this computer to this computer, basically, okay? And all these packets of information. And when, when I was investigating this, remember I was like, okay, I want something I can sink my teeth into, not just these people arguing with each other all the time. And this one day, I had a major epiphany. It was like, you know, ding a ling a ling a ling you know how that happens sometimes, the big light bulb over your head? I discovered that all of the communication theory, all of the math, all of the conceptual ideas that are used in computer networking also apply to the information in DNA. Okay, everything that has to do with how your email gets, you know, from here to your friend in South Africa, everything that has to do with that also relates to how DNA is decoded and copied because it's the same process. It's a process of copying and encoding and decoding information. Opening your email, turning a, turning a strand of DNA into a new cell, on a mathematical level, it's the same thing. It's the same, okay? This is rigorous. This is something you can sink your teeth into. And so here's what I found. And now I want to, I want to go to a business example, and, 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 and this will make sense when I get done explaining it. Um, another book that I wrote is a book on Google advertising. That is the consulting that I do. And if you look, somebody types in Red Wagon and searches on Google, you see those little ads on the right side? Okay. Those ads are Google ads, and Google ads compete with each other in a Darwinian fashion, okay? The ones that get clicked on move up, and the ones that don't get clicked on move down and die, okay? It's natural selection. It's Darwinian, you know, survival of the fittest, okay? And people spend $10 billion a year placing these ads, and and these ads competing with each other. So this is the kind of consulting that I do. Well, I want to show you something really interesting. These are two different ads. What's the difference between the ad on the left and the ad on the right? Easy fast. Easy versus fast. It's that third line in the ad, easy personal protection training, fast personal protection training. Is there any other difference between those two ads? Yeah, one's higher. <laughs> I, I lined up my PowerPoint slide wrong. They're exactly the same except for that one word. Do you think that word makes a difference? Yeah. Yes. Any guess how much difference it makes? A lot. One gets 0.8%, the other one gets 1.3%. The one on the right is actually about 50% better than the one on the left. Well, it's because people who type that word, people who go looking for this happen to like fast better than easy, okay? And you could never usually guess what people really want until you try it, okay? But as you can see, you know, this little blob of text makes a huge difference of one word, okay? Um, and so... The one on the right, over time, will get 50% more clicks for the same amount of money. The, ad the advertiser actually gets to spend less money on every click. Well, I want to show you something. Um, I 
hired a programmer and I, and I had him write this random mutation generator and what it would do is it would randomly change the letters. It would do what the Darwinian version of evolution says is the, is the um, process that makes DNA evolve. Uh, and if you go to randommutation.com, you can play with it. It's online, it's 24-7. You know, you, you, if you wake up at night and you can't sleep, you go, to this, <laughs> you go to this website and you can enter things. And what happens, so you put text in this and you, and you mutate it. So you start out with an, uh, something that looks like this, and then you do one mutation. Do you see the mutation? Yeah. Yeah. Easy pr protection. The I turned into a zero. And then after five mutations, there's more stuff that gets screwed up. Okay? After ten more mutation, there's more stuff that gets screwed up. Okay? Now... If, if, if you follow exactly what Darwinian evolution is claimed to do, the, the claim that is being made is, if we made millions of these ads, and we had little text errors sprinkled in these ads, eventually we'd get a better ad. Okay? That is, that is I am not mischaracterizing this at all. That is what is being said. What is being said is that copying errors in DNA, most of the time are bad, but some of the time are good. Now, what I would encourage you to do is try it for yourself. Go to randommutation.com and, and take any kind of text that you can come up with and see if you can ever make it significantly better. Now, maybe you could make it a little bit better. Like, if there was one letter that was off, you could accidentally substitute the, the wrong letter for the right letter and just get lucky and make it right. But, but what you will find is you can never get it to say something substantially different because you cannot rewrite a sentence one letter at a time. Let me repeat that. You cannot rewrite a sentence, much less a paragraph, a page, or a set of encyclopedias one letter at a time. Why? Because language is so specific. It has words and paragraphs and grammar and syntax, and you always have to follow the rules of the code. And, and, and believe me, there's a lot more complicated rules in DNA than just that it has four letters. Right? Just like in English. 26 letters doesn't mean you can just have a random mutation generator write you a Shakespeare book. It can't be done. And so what happens, by the, by the time this ad has 50 mutations, you can't even read it anymore. Okay? And one of the things, um, what, one of the things that I discovered in, in communication theory, um, in, in the world of communications, if we're sending ones and zeros across the internet, noise... Noise and mutation is the same thing. You want to see random mutation? Turn your TV to channel 69 with no antenna, or what, you know, some channel with no station. That's what it looks like. Okay? Okay, and, and so as a communication engineer, I would frame the question, how much of that do you add to a signal to make it better? <laughs> None. Noise is always bad. Noise always destroys a signal. Noise always destroys information. Like, if, if let's say that you record a TV show from a TV station that's 50 miles away and it's all snowy, you can kind of see it, but, but, but the signal's really loud, take that videotape, you can't take the noise out once it's in. It's an irreversible process. And in the mathematics of this, this is called information entropy. And entropy is a term from thermodynamics. You know how you, you take, you toast your toast, and, and it's hot, and you put it on the counter, and it gets cold? Does it always get cold? Does it ever get warmer? No. 
inform adding noise to a signal is just like that. Adding noise to a signal does not make the signal better any more often than your toast gets hotter when you take it out of the toaster for pretty much the exact same reasons. There is no possible way. I am saying this as a communication engineer, somebody who wrote an Ethernet book, somebody who did control systems, all kinds of stuff as an engineer. There is no way that random mutation is how an antelope turns into a giraffe. And I am not saying an antelope did not evolve into a giraffe. It very well may have happened, but it did not happen randomly or by accident. Absolutely, positively, did not, could not. And it doesn't matter how many chances they have to reproduce, you don't get a better one because you had enough time. Now there's another version of this. Um, Years ago, back in the 20s and 30s, there was a guy named Goldschmidt. And he said, hey, if, if mutations cause evolution, let's have more mutations. And he took these fruit flies, and, and, he, and he hit them with radiation. And he did this for 30 years. He said, if I hit fruit flies with radiation long enough, I'm going to get a fruit fly to evolve into something else. <coughs> He did this for decades, starting in 1906. He got no new species at all. He did this for 30 years. Missing organs, deterioration, sterility, reduced wings, legs, feet growing out of mouth, all kinds of bizarre things. Not a single improved fruit fly after 30 years. Now this is exactly what a communication engineer would tell you to expect. Okay? Hey, I, got, I got this U2 CD and we're going to make billions of copies of it, and every, every single copy is going to have a little bit of an error in it, and once in a while, it's going to improve the album, and we're going to evolve you know, from the Joshua tree to you know, some other album. Does it happen that way? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Random mutation plus natural selection plus time equals extinction. Okay? Now, I want to talk about how we use the word evolution because it's an everyday household word and we use this word a lot when we're, we're not talking about biology or animals at all. When we use the word evolution and we're talking about technology, knowledge, social progress, we are always referring to an intelligent activity. Like the evolution of from the iPod to the iPhone. Amen. Right? <laughs> okay? We have a belief. It didn't yes. happen random. Right? It happened as a result of deliberate choice. Okay? The only time that the word evolution means a random purposeless process is in biology, which is somebody trying to sell you on an idea that runs contrary to experience. Evolution is really chaos resolved by intent. It requires a mind. Okay, and here's my point. The, remember at the beginning of this presentation I said I was going to take this in a different direction than it's normally taken. If evolution happened, it was designed to happen. Okay? And I'm going to explain this a little more. This gal, her name is Barbara McClintock. Um, she won the Nobel Prize in 1983 for what I'm about to describe to you. Okay? She was at Cornell. And way back, 1944 is before DNA was even discovered. DNA was discovered in like 1953, I think. Um, they didn't totally understand DNA, but they did understand something about chromosomes. And Barbara McClintock did very meticulous research on corn maize. And, and here's what she would do. <coughs> see, with, with the, these, uh, these ears of corn, you can see um, the different colors of the corn, of, of, of every individual piece of corn, she could look at the patterns in the corn 
and she could discern what was going on with the chromosomes. And what she would do is she would breed corn, but she would damage the chromosomes. And she did this laborious experimentation for many, many years, and she figured out, what she figured out was that you have a strand of DNA, which is sort of like a CD that's full of information, and what DNA would do is if some of it was damaged, there was a repair mechanism that would find the damaged part, it would take it out, it would go find another part that it thought was as close to suitable as possible, and it would splice it in. Sort of like if you had a book, and there was holes in the pages, and there was missing words and stuff, that you could make an educated guess of what was supposed to be there, and, you, and if the damage wasn't too bad, a person who read it might not know that there, you know, that it had been damaged. Maybe not too different than you know people that uh, study ancient scrolls and they got holes in them and stuff like that. DNA does the same thing when it's damaged. The same thing. It's absolutely remarkable. Nobody believed her. They're like you're crazy. 1944. When was the Nobel Prize? 1983, it, it literally took her 30 plus years to sell her colleagues on the idea that DNA was that smart. The chromosomes of patterns appear in the corn, the damaged chromosomes repair themselves, and this was called transposition. Take, you know, it would, DNA would splice itself and repair itself. Now, um, I want to show you something else. Uh, this is a Barbara McClintock stamp. Uh, National Medal of Science, MacArthur Foundation, Wolf Prize in Medicine, National Women's Hall of Fame, Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine. She was way ahead of her time. Okay. Now, um, what she really discovered was that DNA is intelligent. It's like a computer program that knows how to repair itself. Now, I want to take it a step further. This guy, James Shapiro, he's, a, he's current. He's like still writing books and publishing papers. Uh, he's a very active guy. Now, here's what he discovered. He took McClintock's work and carried it forward. And what he discovered was that uh, um, there was something else that DNA would do in addition to what Barbara McClintock discovered. He discovered that it, like, he, he would take protozoas, uh, which is, you know, a tiny cell, and he would put them under extreme stress. You know, like, not enough sugar, not enough water, not enough whatever. Um, you know, some kind of severe environmental stress. And what he discovered was that that as those protozoas reproduced, they would splice their own DNA into over 100,000 pieces, rearrange the pieces, and produce a new protozoa that was substantially different so that it could survive the new environment. And this is how, this is why germs resist antibiotics. It's because they're reprogramming themselves. Okay, this is, it doesn't happen by accident, okay? That somewhere in there is a mechanism that goes, we can't fight this, let's like, let's rearrange the design. Take this piece, move it over here, this piece, move it over here, this piece, move it over here. And uh, so we're going to make one copy of us that's like this, and we're going to make another that's like this, we're going to, another version that's like this, and another version that's like this. Is this like getting more and more remarkable the further it goes? This is so far from random mutation, it's the opposite direction. Random mutation would just destroy it. Okay? This, this is a program that evolves itself. So let me ask you a question. 
You know, most of us have been using Windows for a long time. There was Windows 95, and there were, well, there were, first there was DOS, right? There was DOS, and then there was Windows 95, and there was Windows 98, there was Windows ME, and there was XP, and there was, um, there was 2000, and there's Vista, right? Now, it took like 40,000 engineers or something to like make all these new versions of Windows, right? What if, what if the original DOS program was so sophisticated that it just rewrote itself for the last 20 years and nobody had to program it and it just kept getting better and better? We wouldn't have Vista. We wouldn't have Vista. <laughs> I mean, what, what, if, what if it could do that? W would, you, would you look at the original, would the original engineer who designed this be, like, considered smarter than all the other 40,000 guys put together? Absolutely. So here's what I'm saying. You can look at all the fossils and all this kind of stuff, and people argue about this stuff. Creation versus evolution and everything. Okay, fine. But wait, it's not a random pro evolution is not a random process. It's an engineered process. Okay? Can the protozoa the protozoa um, reconfigures itself into a considerably different kind of protozoa? Can it turn eventually? Can it turn into a human? I don't know. But if it can, the ability was designed in, and it's a heck of a lot more of an impressive design than anything humans have ever done. Because Microsoft still has 40,000 people on the payroll. I'm sure, I'm sure Bill Gates would love to get rid of all those people and just have the thing, you know, what if it could rewrite itself and the next version of Windows could just, you know, happen all by itself? What if you didn't need antivirus software, the thing that would just automatically adapt and go, oh, we got a new virus here, so let's... Sh I mean, that could be a whole conversation about how your immune system works because that's what it does. When your immune system learns to fight off a new disease, it does it by splicing DNA into a whole bunch of pieces and passing the new information on to the next cells and the next cells and the next cells. And so that's what Shapiro discovered. He said DNA, it's not like a CD full of data. It's like an operating system that cleans up files and maintains things. It's absolutely remarkable. Evolution is an engineered process. Um, living things, at least to some extent, as seen in the laboratory, living things are designed to evolve. Now, science, definition of science, the observation, identification, description, experimental investigation, theoretical explanation of phenomena. Okay? Now, if we say evolution happens randomly, that's not science because you can't reproduce it. You can't investigate it. You just have a story, oh, here's what happened. You can't make it happen over again. You don't understand how the giraffe neck got to be the way it is. You just have a, well, here's the way it is. Just accept it. But see, if evolution is an engineered process, now you have a way of taking apart this process. How did a giraffe neck really get to be what it is? And if you understand that, then maybe Microsoft can figure out how to make the next version of Windows right itself, rather than every you know a bunch of, you know thousands of engineers having to sit there and go through 20 million lines of bad code and try to make it better, right? So if you say the origin of life was by accident, that is not a scientific answer. If you say evolution is a random process, that is not a scientific answer. Evolution is not a random process, it's an engineered process, and an engineered process is scientific. You can study that. So suddenly the study of evolution has practical application. If you get down to how does this really happen, maybe you can write better computer programs, maybe you can make better iPods and iPhones. And I want to point out something. Remember the whole conversation here revolved around the idea of a code. It all revolved around the idea that DNA was not just a molecule, it was a language. And I find it very interesting that in Genesis 1, every creation event is preceded by the words, and God said. 
And God said, let there be light. And God said, let there be, let there be. And then, I think even more significantly, in the book of John, John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Through Him all things were made. There is nothing that has been made that was not made through Him. He was in the beginning with God. That, that, that God and the Trinity, that that Jesus as the expression of the Trinity is language. That language is the basis of all creative acts. That for a new baby to be born, for a new cell to divide, it's a process of communication. That communication and language is the metaphor that unlocks the mystery of life. And that is what I have for you today. I am done. We can take questions after.